All right, I am excited to welcome a new guest to our channel, Jaden May with Adams Wealth Advisors. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. This is so great. And the topic that you are going to talk about is super relevant for me, for our channel who knows about my mom. They know that she has passed recently. And I think what we're going to talk about is going to be applicable to all of us. So maybe just really condensed for those who are starting this video, what are we going to cover here and why should they watch it? Yes, definitely. So today we're going to be talking about what happens when someone sp passes away, specifically a spouse, and planning things that you can do to tackle some of those big financial decisions that head your way when you lose someone that is a big part of your financial plan. So we'll be talking about things that you can do to get ahead of that. I've found that if you do a little bit of planning while you're not grieving, you know, before you have, you're in the middle of this big life transition, it can go a really long way in smoothing out that transition down the road. That's It's hard no matter what you do, but there's a few things you can do that can ease the ease your mind a little bit. Yeah, that's perfect. And it seems like in my experience with this, you kind of have the spouse that wants to get this all set up so that their spouse doesn't have to worry about it. And you also have the other spouse that is kind of pushing like, hey, you should do this because I don't want to have to worry about it. Do you see that dynamic? Do you ever see couples where it's kind of like one is wanting to do this and the other yes. one's like, ah, I don't care? Yeah, all the time. And it's really interesting. I've seen, we have a lot of clients that there's one spouse that tends to hone in on the finance aspect of their life. And so we might even have a few meetings with only one spouse before even the second spouse is even brought in. And I've found it's really interesting bringing in both spouses together to have this conversation because that's usually when the action really happens. And, you know, it's... You have one spouse can plan as much as they want to, but unless both spouses are on board, it really can only go so far until they both can come together and make some decisions and prepare for that together. I'm going to ask a weird question here. Like, why do you care about this topic? Yeah, good question. So I actually came from a family. I have two grandmas that lost their spouses, one at 49 and one at 57. And so I was young when they lost their spouses, um, it's been over 20 years ago, and it had a really big impact on my life as on both sides of my family, we lost our grandpas and watching my grandmas over the years as they evolved and had to navigate this space by themselves and seeing how they've handled it. And not only over the past 20 years, but there's things that have came up recently that they're still getting questions on. I mean, this isn't something, losing a spouse isn't something that it's just the first couple of years of planning and then you're good. I mean, this is the rest of your life. So that had a really big impact on me. And, and, uh, I decided really early on that if there's anything I can do to help people through this, I would love to be part of that and to, to coach people through these decisions and really empower them and give them confidence because we're so much more capable than we give ourselves credit for. And so it's been an awesome experience helping people see that about themselves. That's awesome. So was, you kind of reminded me of a few things. So let's see if I can tackle them. One, you're a financial advisor. You're going to you're gonna help people from that aspect of it. And we're going to have a link in the description to you and your to your page and everything that's related to you. So if people want to reach out, they can. But So there's a financial advisor that I think comes into this picture or can come into this picture. What other people, whether that's a professional, whether that's maybe they're really good at certain things, should be involved once a spouse passes away? Yeah, I think, I think for spouses, surviving spouses, it's important to know that you do not have to do this alone and that there are people out there that can help coach you through that. So from a professional standpoint on, you know, the business and finance side, I think it's very important to have a tax accountant that can coach you through this. And you're going to be changed. You might have some changes to income. Um, there might be some changes to your tax situation. Uh, you're now maybe filing as single instead of married, and that can have some really big and really big impact on things. So having a really good tax accountant in your corner to rely on through this is huge. Also an estate attorney. So depending on how you structure your estate, whether that's having an attorney to actually guide you through the probate process, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, um, or if it's just revising your estate documents now. Now that your spouse has passed away, you're going to need to overhaul a few things. So get an attorney that you trust that can guide you through that. Obviously, a financial planner and an investment manager, um, they tend to be the at least I like to be the quarterback when it comes to these different financial professionals so that they can come to me and then we can relay information and pull it all together into one financial plan. Um, and then also 
having some good, a, a family member or a friend, someone that's in your corner that you can rely on. I also think that it is very beneficial to identify that person before you're in a situation that you're right in the heat of things. So if most people, I mean, if it's a really good friend or family member, they're not going to mind if you go to them and say, hey, I'm, you know, we're, we're doing our estate plan. We're planning for for our, you know, hopefully this is decades down the road. We don't have to deal with this for a really long time. But if something were to happen, would you mind stepping in and and being there for me? And maybe even giving him a little bit of background information about what you might need some help with. I love when my clients bring in their family members while they're still here and we can talk through their estate plan and maybe leave out some details that they don't want kids to know about yet, but at least they're introduced to me and they start to, to, you know, meet these other people that are part of the financial plan so that when a child has to step in, whether that's a child when both parents pass away or when just one parent passes away, um, they're prepared for that and they, they can really coach their parent through it. Yeah. I really like what you said where you're not alone. I think that At least for me, I think there's a type of person where as stresses start to come up, I kind of go internal and I kind of, I hate reaching out for help, right? Like if, hey, I reaching out for charity or whatever it is. And so, especially with this experience that we've gone through to be able to be like, okay, can, can you come in and help me with this? You're good at this. Even with us siblings, like my sister loves the declutter process. So she went through the house. She was able to declutter everything. My, my brother is a whiz at finances and all of the insurance stuff and everything that I think we'll talk about. So being being open and willing to let people come in and help and then on the professional side as well. When you talk about a good tax accountant and a state planner, what do you look for in those professionals to make them good or to make them useful in this situation? What yeah. what traits would make them good? I think finding someone that is competent and, you know, has the skills that they need to execute the job is the easy part. Obviously, that's important. You need someone that you know you can rely on to get the job done, that has the experience, has the expertise, the credentials, whatever it is, you know, the, the good Google reviews that you you feel like you can go to that firm or wherever it is. Um, but what I think is most important is having someone that listens to you and that allows you to ask questions, listens, finds solutions with you. Um, I think that's the most important thing when it comes to finding not just a professional, but anyone in your corner during that time. Uh, oftentimes, there's not easy solutions for things, and there's it's just a hard situation. There's always going to be an exception that comes up. Yes, you know? exactly. And even the the financial plans that they spend decades planning for this, and they have attorneys and accountants and a you know a really detailed trust. Even those plans, there are issues that come up and there are things that can rattle the family members a little bit or confuse them. So I think it's more important than anything. It's just finding people that you can talk to and that you can trust and that you know are listening to you. Perfect. Let's walk through some of the policies or the accounts to look for when somebody passes because I don't know that my wife knows that we ha- that I have life insurance. Yeah. I don't know if she knows these accounts because we haven't really had that conversation, but Um, when somebody passes away, how do you find out if they did have a life insurance policy, HSAs, HRAs, other types of accounts, investments? What does that process look like? And then getting those over to be usable for you? Mm -hmm. It it depends on how much planning was done beforehand. So for clients that work with me, ideally we have a consolidated balance sheet where we have mapped out anything that is related to you and your financial picture. We have that all consolidated in in one, one place. So you can sit down and we can start going through the list of here's everything that we had record of. We have statements on file and we can just roll this, start rolling this out, you know, start checking them off the list. That is not always the case. And even if you do all of that planning, there's things that are left off. So what usually what this ends up looking like is just doing your absolute best to pull together as much information as you can contact the professionals that the the person that's passed away had worked with. Oftentimes they have a lot more information than you, than you might think, you know, past tax returns and past bank statements to see what activity was going on. When it comes to life insurance policies specifically, really if you can find out the custodian of the life insurance policy or the insurance company that it's with, that will give you, that is really all you need to know because you can call them up and they will guide you through it and hold your hand. And all you need is information of the person that passed away and they'll give you everything. The hardest part is finding out who that custodian is, who you even need to be reaching out to. 
So if you reach out to your insurance agent and they don't have that information, there is actually a resource. The National Association of Insurance Commission has a resource where you can look up policies of people that have passed away. And so they have a database where you can go online, find that information, and do a check. So I don't have to do that very often, but it is something that's there if you don't have anywhere to go. So as we talk about life insurance policies, um, I'm naive with all of this, but if it's a lump sum payment, let's say that I have a million dollar life insurance policy, am I getting a check for a million dollars that just hits my account? Or is that something that turns into an annuity? How does that all function? Yeah. Yeah. So let's walk through the life insurance claim process. So if someone passes away and you contact the life insurance company and notify them of the death, you'll be required to have a death certificate before they'll process the claim. So you might have to wait a week or two before you get that death certificate in hand and you can call back and mail that in to show record of them passing away. It's usually a very quick process. Typically within a month, we see a payout of the policy, sometimes a little bit longer, but most of the time within a few weeks, you can have that money in hand. When you go to make a claim and formally receive that money, they usually give you a few options. And one of those options is to leave it where it's at. You can leave it as a lump sum. Oftentimes they'll guarantee a very conservative interest rate on it. And you can just park it there and set it and forget it. I see some people do this when maybe they're just overwhelmed with decisions and it's one more thing to think about and it's easier to just let it sit and do its thing. And that's sometimes totally fine, can cause some maybe some issues down the road if it's years and years, and there may be some other investment options that could have been better. The other option would be to take an annuity payment. So the life insurance company will actually guarantee some income, and they'll give you some options on how you want that paid out over your life or over a fixed period of time, and you can receive the payout over time. So it's important to work with an advisor to find out what the rate of return is on that. Um, sometimes it sounds good to have this income split up throughout time, but if there are better options that you could get higher returns elsewhere, you'd want to be aware of that and, and run the scenarios. The third option is to just get a check and, and take your money and run. And that's most common. Most of the time you'll get a check in the mail and they'll send you the funds free and clear um, and then it's up to you to decide what you want to do. And that's the hardest part because for some people, it's a clear path on maybe debt payoff, receiving some income to, to get by for a while as you're in a transitionary period. It could be saving for retirement or college funds. I mean, there's a, a lot of different options when it comes of, to what to do with this money. But receiving that lump sum will give you the most options because now you get to decide what happens with that versus, you know, leaving it in the, the hands of the insurance carrier. Are there tax consequences with that? Because I think it just makes me go, this is a much more sad instance. But on the other side, I think of like, oh, if I won the lottery, right, do I take the lump sum or do I take the annuity? And, and with those, there are some pretty intense tax consequences of taking mm -hmm. one or the other. Is that the same on a life insurance side or is that not really coming no. into the equation? So life insurance has is taxed much more favorably than other assets. Um, I would go as far to say as life insurance might be the most favorable from a tax st standpoint. Life insurance proceeds are typically not taxable at all. So most payouts that you receive from an income tax standpoint, no tax will be due. This could be this could be different if you have an employer sponsored plan. If it's employer paid coverage, then I have seen some circumstances where maybe only a portion of it is tax free, and they'll ask for some tax on the other side. But if you have a private insurance policy that you've been paying for on yourself, usually it's a completely tax free payout. Yeah, that makes sense then. Why most take the lump sum up front rather than delaying that yes. tax burden? I guess. You brought up employer stuff. So that that also reminded me because my mom had passed when she passed. She worked for a long time with the company. We found out later that she had an HRA. Um, there was a pension involved. It sounds like that pension is no longer applicable to once she passes. So maybe you could walk us through employer sponsored pensions and accounts that yes. make sense to look at when somebody passes. Definitely. Pensions are a big one. Um, obviously, the easier ones are the 401ks because or a retirement plan structure because usually there are beneficiaries listed on file and those assets can pass very easily. Usually, you get a death certificate and that can be a few weeks before the money can be split out between the kids or, or the spouse. 
when it comes to um, pension plans, there are some more options. And what's hard about pensions pl- pension plans is the treatment of these plans is actually decided usually when they retire. They elect what plan or what uh, payout option they want to receive. And sometimes that's over their own life. And sometimes they elect a payout option that can be over both spouses' lives. And it's a joint life payout. And so that can have a huge impact on the retirement plan of between spouses. If one person passes away, we want to make sure that there will be income in some form, whether it's from that pension or from another source, to take care of that spouse if they lose income. Um, also, Real quick on that, if it's yeah. if it's your own life versus you and your spouse's life, does that mean that theoretically the payout would be lower if you're choosing both versus if you just choose yourself? Yes, they'll both? give you a haircut on it. Okay. So if you choose the joint light off option, then you will receive less money usually okay. on a monthly basis. But the trade off is now it's getting paid out for more time. So another opportunity that we can run an analysis to see what's that break even point, how long would you have to live to make it worth it, and you know look at health in your family and decide what's best for you and your family. Perfect. And it sounds like you mentioned beneficiary if they're listed. It sounds like with all of these plans, as long as a beneficiary is listed, it's relatively straightforward and easy. If they don't have a beneficiary listed, what happens? Yes. So that will take you through the probate process. So it isn't, it, it doesn't get lost into the abyss. There's still hope. You, you still will likely receive a payout if you are the rightful heir to the money, but it will have to go through a court process to get to that point. So the probate process is that formal court process where a judge provides the stamp of approval. They take into account a, a will that was in place by the deceased person. Or if there wasn't a will, then they reference state law to de- determine how these assets will be split out. So this process can take a couple of months, um, up to a couple of years, depending on the size of the estate. A strategy that many people put into place is establishing a trust because a trust bypasses the probate process. So there are the two main ways to get out of the probate process. If you outright list a beneficiary on something, that usually will bypass probate and that person can get the money. Um, or you list the asset inside of a trust or place it inside of a trust. That way, the trustee is able to step in and execute the wishes of the deceased person, and they don't have to go through the courts to get that that final stamp from the judge. So it streamlined thing, streamline things a lot to have a trust or some sort of estate plan in place. Make sure that your beneficiaries are up to date and on file so that the money can get to the, not only can the money get to the person that it needs to get to, but as fast as possible, because it can get drawn out for way too long. Yeah. And you you can decide how deep you want to go on this. But um, one thing that our family encountered is that my mom put my sister's name on the house title. And luckily, about nine months before, we were able to recognize that and say, hey, hold on. Would you be able to explain why that yeah. like, you're you're better at this than me, but there was a reasoning behind that as to Yeah, I hear this all the time. Many people are advised or they hear through friends of friends or whatever it is that they need to put their kids or someone that is younger than them on bank accounts and on their home or their real estate assets so that it will pass easier if they were to pass away or if that, that person could step in easier. That is not the case. There are other ways to give that person authority to make those decisions. The problem that you run into with that is tax planning. So when you pass away, you're able to pass assets tax-free to your children in the sense that they receive a step-up in basis. So if you are sitting on a whole bunch of land and maybe you bought this land clear back in, you know, the 70s for $1,000. $1,000. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now that land is worth millions of dollars and you pass away and that land now goes to your kids. Your kids will not be liable for that huge gain that has been established or has been accumulating on that property because of a step up in basis. So at that point, it is it is almost as if the IRS acts as if your kid bought it at the date of death at that value, and then they only have to pay a taxable gain on whatever the the fluctuation uh, or whatever increase is accumulated after the date of death. So that's a very a big incentive to keep assets in your own name so that they can pass to your kids and they get a step up in basis and those assets are tax-free. 
you'll run into a problem if you pass that to your kids before you pass away. So when you pass that to them, and maybe now you go 50-50 on your home or a, a real estate asset, and then you pass away, that 50% that's owned by your kid will not get the step up in basis. So if they decide to sell the asset, they're still on the hook for that really big taxable gain that was accumulated over decades. And it's a same thing with your bank accounts. You know, it, it, you can run into some big issues if there are some gains that have accumulated. Thank you for covering that because, again, that's something that when our family wasn't even thinking of it, my mom was like, oh, this will just make it easier. Let's put my sister on on the house. And yes, luckily, we, we were able to stop that. Yeah. Um, a lot of our audience are on Social Security so, so or, or they're approaching that Social Security conversation. So where do Social Security benefits start to come into play here once a spouse passes away? Yes. So Social Security has a survivor benefit option. So if a spouse passes away, how the social security system looks at it, and I've seen in other videos of yours, I think you guys do a great job at spelling this out. So go watch those other videos if you haven't already. But the social security system will look at your social security income and your spouse's social security income if you're both already polling, and you will be able to continue receiving the higher of the two. So if your house, if your spouse's benefit was higher than yours, at that point, your social security benefit would be trued up so that you're receiving the highest of the two benefits. Um, if you're not pulling social security yet, there could be some other planning opportunities with the survivor benefit. So I've seen many clients that they'll give you, they'll, uh, I've seen many clients that they will pull their survivor benefit when they're 60, 62, you know, they, right when they can, they're going to pull that, so that survivor benefit, get as much income as they can until they reach age 70. During that time, their own social security benefit is accruing. And then at age 70, we make the phone call to the social security office and we switch that over and they now receive the higher benefit that's their own. So that's one strategy that comes with social security planning. There are all sorts of planning opportunities that can come up with that. But just because your spouse passes away doesn't mean that you entirely lose those benefits. There's still benefits there and we can work those into your plan. Yeah, I think that's great. I'm going to get ahead of some of the comments or questions that I know are going to come from that because there used to be a strategy around social security where you could take a spousal benefit, let your own grow, and then take it later. That's a spousal benefit, not a survivor benefit. So they're two very different things. So I get asked all the time in comments Mm -hmm. and in emails of like, hey, can I take my spouse's benefit now and then I'll let mine grow? And the answer is no, it doesn't work like that anymore. anymore. Yeah, I think it was like 2016 or something Mm -hmm. when they when they ended that. What about so we're we're assuming that spouses have gotten along and they're still together. Mm -hmm. My mom and my dad did not get along and they were not together. So Mm -hmm. what about like ex-spouses? Where does that come into play with um, the passing of one of them? So if you were married for 10 years or longer, you will still be eligible to receive a survivor benefit off of the spouse that has passed away. So even if you're not currently married, there still is an opportunity there for their benefits to to be pulled by an ex-spouse. So not being married anymore doesn't, you know, you still have some options. You still have spousal benefit options and survivor benefit options if you have an ex. But I will say something to keep in mind. I've worked with a client recently who has had two spouses pass away during her life. And so her, she had a spouse that passed away a couple of decades ago. She had been receiving that survivor benefit. She remarried after age 60. And at that point had continued receiving her old survivor benefits. Well, her other, her most recent spouse just passed away, and this was only in November. And so I had advised her, let's get on a call with the the social security office and figure out if if there's some options for an increase here. And she she didn't want to do it because she was advised, well, she went into her funeral home and she said that they took care of all of the filing to social security. And funeral homes do typically notify the social security office of someone that's passed away. Um, but the social security office is usually not calling you to let you know that there's more money on the table. So we got on a phone call just a couple of weeks ago and I advised strongly, I think it's worth getting on this call. Um, got, got a hold of the social security office and found out that she had an extra $200 in benefits per month that she would start receiving from her, her most recent spouse's record. Yeah. 
And so it's definitely worth the phone calls. It's worth digging into this, even if if you've had multiple spouses to see what the best option is out there. Because I've seen with the Social Security office, if you've had multiple marriages, they're not going to dig back for you. You're going to have to guide that conversation with them. If I had a dime for every time I heard somebody say they called the Social Security Administration and... uh, how do I phrase this nicely? Got advice that wasn't getting them the most money. Um, I'd have a lot of dimes. And All the time. <laughs> yes. Social Security Administration, bless them for what they do. They have a lot of calls and things and various things coming in. They are not financial advisors. They are not financial planners. So you can call them, but I highly recommend working with a Social Security expert outside of that to, to do what totally you just mentioned. Totally agree. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth the extra digging. Absolutely worth so it. So we've talked about... We've talked about life insurance plans. We've talked about 401ks, pensions, social security. How often should somebody revisit the plan that they, again, somebody comes and meets with you. You've set up a plan. 10 years have passed. How often should somebody be revisiting that, checking beneficiaries, grandkids could come into play? Maybe you could walk us through what that looks like in your experience. Yeah, I think the financial plan, it's always a moving target. So if you're working with an advisor, I mean, the clients that I work with, we at least have one deep dive meeting per year where we reassess where things are at, what changes have been made, and then we can pivot from there based on what the last year has brought. I think that if you're doing it on your own, at least every couple of years, when it comes to your legal documents and your estate plan, keep a close eye on those. Every couple of years, take a peek, see if there's something that needs updated. It's not fun weekend reading. So that's where I do think it's definitely worth having an advisor in your corner to help you through that and to remind you to do that. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with a client that we get their estate documents and they haven't been looked at in 20 years and we're, you know, dusting them off to dig into it. And they've had changes in their children, changes in all aspects of their life. And we have to go do an overhaul. And so definitely worth keeping that on on front of mind. I also think that it's a lot easier to make little smaller decisions more often than to be making very big decisions, even if you space those out over time. Um, So when it comes to retirement and losing a spouse and, and setting up your financial plan, it really helps when you have a base plan in place. And then we can meet frequently and make tweaks to that versus someone coming in where they are in the middle of a life transition and we're starting from scratch and trying to figure it out, which we'll figure it out, but it really helps for the client's peace of mind when we have a, a good head start on that. Yeah, we, we, had a, we had a 20-year-old version of the will at the time, and at that time, my mom only had one grandchild, and so she had put in there the one grandchild um, – she had two. There's two drinkers. So she put the two grandchildren, but the second one, that couple, so my brother and his wife ended up getting divorced. And so that changed things. So 20 years later, she's got 16 grandkids and divorces have happened and other things have happened. So yeah, the nine months before she passed, we revisited it, but it had been a 20 year gap between when that yeah. one was written and when we revisited it. So that could have been a bigger problem than it was. Luckily, luckily we were able to, to touch on that. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So uh, again, assuming everybody is happy, the love of their life has just passed away, years go by, and now they want to get remarried. I feel like there are going to be some important conversations that come up there. And just off the top of my head, I think of, uh, is a prenup involved or, or other things like that? So take me through that remarriage thought process um, from a financial perspective to to protect both spouses and what they yeah. should be thinking about. Yeah, there are a few things that you can do while while both spouses are still alive to maybe protect some assets and do some estate planning to make sure that the assets get to the children as you both want at that time. So definitely update and revise your estate plan. I know it's really difficult. Like you said, you're married to the love of your life. You don't think that that you would never imagine being with anyone else. I would say though, plan for plan for it anyway, because I've seen too often that People, you know, it it will never happen to me. And then all of a sudden, fast forward, you're in this situation and you can be put in a stickier situation when you're having to very directly ask for a prenup. And it's a lot easier when you already have an estate plan spelled out that this is just part of your process, right? It isn't this manual decision that can cause people a lot of stress of having to divide these assets. If the assets have already been divided and that's already set in place, 
as you enter into a remarriage. But a remarriage does change things. So when it comes to Social Security benefits, even if you remarry before the age of 60, it will have a dramatic impact on your survivor benefit eligibility. So it's really important if you're thinking about remarrying to take a look at how that will impact all parts of your financial plan. And usually there's ways to, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to be with someone there, we will figure something out to make it work. But it's a lot easier when we do some of that planning and get the groundwork established on yourself, also on your kids. I've seen it so many times that it's just when it's already set up and in place and there's that peace of mind knowing that dad's wishes or mom's wishes are being honored, even if they're not here, it goes a really long way with the whole family. Yeah. I mean, finances cause a strain in relationships, whether again, that's spouses or potential spouses or kids or grandkids. So if you can iron that all out, it just seems like it's, it's really comforting. I would think, let me ask you this. Um, how does this whole conversation that we've been having change if somebody is single, never married? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So really the main change is that rather than it being a spouse that is going through this, it's likely going to be your kids or the executor of your trust that's having to deal with this. So a lot of the same principles apply. The only difference is that kids and or kids are not usually eligible for those spousal benefits when it comes to social security. Um, oftentimes even pensions, if it's really important to make a decision on your pension plans during your pre-retiree years based on something potentially happening because there are those people that they go in and they do the the single life pension plan and then a couple years later they pass away there's nothing there for their spouse there's nothing there for their kids you know it just is gone whereas there are lump sum pension options that can pass generations so take a look at you know i think it, at the end of the day when it comes down to it whether you're a spouse or whether you're a kid it's really hard to lose someone you're likely going to be facing very similar problems when it comes to getting these assets passed into the next generation's name, but it is possible. And with a little bit of planning beforehand, it's a lot easier. No, that's, that's great. I really appreciate that. Is there anything that we didn't cover as somebody is going through this conversation that are common topics that come up for you? I think that this is a really good start. If you've, if this has been something that's on your mind, I think this is a really good start to give you an idea of some things that you need to start thinking about. At the end of the day, everyone is different. Everyone has their own unique needs and family situations. So build a plan that's customized to you and get some professionals in your corner, some people in your corner to help coach you through it. No, that's great. I I completely agree with you. Um, And then if anybody listening to this, so often people want us to tell them what to do in a YouTube video, right? And where you live matters and what your arrangement matters. And we did a video on like HSAs and passing that off to a spouse there. you The spouse gets all the tax benefits, but a child doesn't or another mm-hmm. person does. So your situation is going to be unique to you. If you enjoyed this conversation and you want to reach out to Jaden or her team, and again, in the in the description, we'll have it pop up here on the screen of how you can get a hold of them. And Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to answer these questions. I love doing this. This is my passion. So any questions that come up, let's schedule a call and we can we can build a plan for you individually. You're fantastic. I hope that you will come back and be on here again. Thank you. Thank you.